So there's something very important um, about our faith in God. First of all, the Bible teaches that we must have faith and put our faith in Jesus. And in Hebrews, it says that peop the, the people of old, even in the Old Testament, were, were commended because of their faith. So there's this idea that there is a responsibility of man to put their faith in Jesus. But the, what we're going to talk about today is something that's very difficult to understand in some ways, but also very simple in some ways if you simplify who God really is in his nature and in his, his person. But it's concerning predestination and election. Now, we have to begin with faith because the Bible does say... <laughs> So then faith, in Romans 10, 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. And the word of God came from God, and uh, he obviously is the initiator of all things. So we should never have uh, any pride and boast in what we have come up with in our own mind or in our own flesh, as many do in their religions. Uh, their, their wisdom of men, their doctrines of men, we don't want to be in a religious group like that in many ways and in, in all ways that is a cult if it's if it's of you and by you and for you um it's not of god so faith is important now faith is a substance of substance of things hoped for but the evidence of things not seen in hebrews 11 um, one. So the evidence of things not seen. So we cannot see God. We cannot see Jesus as uh, Moses did in the wilderness. You know, he spoke to God face to face. You know, there was a burning bush. Now, obviously, every time you speak to God or every time there has been someone in the Bible who has spoke with God or wrestled with God or whatever with God or went into the temple or the tabernacle and they went to the holiest of holies and God came upon them, it was always in an earthly form. It was either in a form of fire, a burning bush, a tabernacle, in the form of Jesus, which is his son, which is God. Um, and you have to realize that because if you actually saw Jesus face to face, you would die. You would, you would immediately die. You would have to fall on your face and you would die if you looked on him because he's that holy. He's that righteous. But how does election come into play with, with man's responsibility? So God, in his word, all over calls us to believe. In his word, all over, he calls us to put our faith in Jesus but there's this very interesting thing in the Bible that um, it seems to also make the argument that there was a plan before time began that God had elected some, that God had predestined some. Um, for example, you know, you got John the Baptist and then you have Jesus and, and the babies are kicking in their womb. There was a plan for both of those babies before time began. And, and the moms were even told about it before the babies would. So there's, there's this futuristic God who can almost time travel. There's a God that can go back in history and go back to the beginnings. And, you know, God, if you, if you think about God, and this is, this is, I think, important for you to realize when you're evaluating all of these co complex components in the Bible, is that you have man who's stuck in this time zone of time. You have man who's who, who who we can see only the present and the past in what we've experienced, but we are given tidbits of prophetic future events. And I think one thing we have to realize is that those tidbits of future events that are predestined will come to plot. They will come to pass because God is a God that, you know, he can get in like a time capsule and go back to the history. He can get in a time capsule and go to the future because he is the first. He's the last. He's the creator of time. So if we limit him and say, well, something is predestined, we're actually saying, well, God, you know, the time past, you know, the time in the future, you know what will take place. You know what has taken place because you are time in and of itself. In some ways, God cannot be bound by a predetermined future. Now, now what, am I, what am I saying by that? So if your name, your name, like put your name in this blank, such and such, dot 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 will do this okay now if you can find in the bible your name written okay and it says something about your name and that you will do this in the future well 
you can pretty much guarantee that that is predestined to happen, that you are elect to do that. And the Bible is very clear about that. There were some people that were elect to do certain things in Scripture. For example, maybe Judas, in, in some ways, was was kind of elect to be the betrayer. Or maybe um, Peter was it was elect in some ways to to deny Jesus. Maybe the twelve apostles were elect at some time to become the twelve apostles and and do what they were going to do. Uh, maybe not. You maybe you couldn't go that far because the Bible did say that they left their nets, that they left what they were doing and they followed Jesus. And and there is some aspect of human responsibility in that. So maybe I'm going too far with that, but. There is things in the Bible that alludes to a predetermined plan for some. And they're written down in Scripture for those people. Now, if your name is not written in the Bible, you can't say that about you. Because you don't know, you haven't been given a vision of the future. You haven't been given a vision of God who is timeless, who is the beginning and end, and knows what will happen or take place in the future. Now, if, if, you were, if you were to have been given that through the God's Word, then you can pretty much predetermine that that's what's going to... You can have a predestined plan or idea or you have an election at some point to do something. <laughs> and there's nothing you can do that can change that. Um, but you, your name's not written in there like that. Now, I'm, why am I saying all these things? You may be confused as if this is something nutty that you're hearing. So let's go ahead and go into the Bible and let's let's read some of these important verses that I'm talking about, such as like uh, Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5. It says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before you camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee, and I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. So, there was a prophet he was written about, and he was writing, and he's writing about the predestined plan of that prophet. Okay, let's, let's go to another one. Um, let's look at John. John chapter 15, verse 16. Ye have... Not cho- you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that you that your fruit should remain, and that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, ye may have it. You y- he may give it you. So you haven't chosen Jesus; he chose you. So I mean, it almost it almost goes in the complete opposite direction like when you're reading scripture and it says put your faith in me it's almost like well you're cho- you're choosing me well yes and no because god is obviously knocking you know god gave his word to you he's the one drawing you in and by you saying yes to him does that mean you've chosen him no so you have to distinguish the difference between you choosing god and having faith in god they're different and so then we have to go to that verse about faith being a gift, and it's it's very clear in the Bible that um, that faith is a gift, um, and I'll I'll go ahead and go to that in a second. Um, but let's go and look at another one. Let's go ahead and look at Romans, Romans, Romans chapter eight. And uh, if you look at Romans chapter eight, it says uh, where is it? Chapter eight, verse. Romans chapter 8, verse 29. For whom he did foreknow, so f- from whom he did foreknow, like he foreknew you, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of, of his son, that he might be the firstborn among my many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, then he also called. And whom he called, then he also justified. And whom he justified, then he also glorified. What shall we say that to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. 
Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, sword? As it is written, for thy sake we are killed all day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things to come, nor things... Nor, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. <laughs> so whom he called, he pre You know, there's, there's this idea of time past, time present, and it will go on to your, um, to your future. Like, like even in Christ, there's this idea that nor height, nor death, nor anything else can separate us from this love. You, like what is what should that do with all the other verses in scripture that call us to keep the faith and, and persevere to the end fight the good fight and and pride cometh before a fall and all these these ideas that well up in us like well it, there is a responsibility all through scripture so what do i do with these verses and for me you have to realize in the bible that there is one there is one God, and that God is timeless. He created time, and he's working in and out of time. And if you imagine God, like, let's just imagine God is painting a picture, right? Like, you, you can't think of God as painting a picture in the human world where, you know, you got red here and blue there, but yet he can't change that. Because someone who's in and out of time can change whatever he wants, does that make sense? Like someone who is in the future but can go in the past can change the past. Someone in the past can give you a vision of the future. But if you're in the future, beyond that future, you can change what is beyond in your future. It, 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 I know it becomes confusing in some ways, but but God is is timeless. He's 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 he persists through all periods of time. And that is why you see these verses here. There are some things written in Scripture that shows us the future that God knows. Those things are predestinated. Those things are those things are those things are going to happen. Like when you when you read the book of Revelation, you notice that in the book, book of Revelation that there will come a time when the Lamb will return, there will be a great battle, and I think there's even three battles there in Revelation that you'll notice, and that at the end of that battle, God will win. <laughs> Satan will lose. And all those type of things that were given of the future, I think we should see that as a plan of God, as a time that will be pre that is a predetermined plan because God has given us a vision of the future. He's given a, a vision into a timeless thing that will happen. And this is why we see election and predestination in the Bible. And and we should never, ever, ever, and this is my this is just my opinion, but it's almost as if it's fact in some ways to me. We should never, ever, ever have so much pride in our lives that if we don't see our name in the Bible, that we should go on to say something like this. Well, once saved, always saved. You know, I gave my life to Jesus. I had faith in Jesus. I put my faith in Jesus in the past. And so the future is predetermined. Well, why can you not say that? Because your name, and the Bible clearly teaches this in many scriptures, that your name is, let's just say it's written in the book of life, okay? Well, God is the one still in control of time. He's even in control of blotting your, the Bible talks about blotting names out. Like it's possible that God could blot a name out. So if God can blot a name out of a book of life, then even the book of life in and of itself is not predetermined unless your name is written there in scripture and says you know like on the mountain of transfiguration such and such came down and i saw moses or whatever or elijah that's giving us a vision of those people did make it okay they made it to that future kingdom okay you are still in the presence in the fixed in the fixed time frame of life 
okay? And there is a test in that time frame. You put your faith in Jesus. That faith, if you continue to put that faith in Jesus, at the end of your life, Jesus might say, well done, my good and faithful servant, because you've trusted in him your whole life. Now, if you put your faith in Jesus, your name's written in that book, and you're, you're inside this area of time, until you're out of this time frame, you have the possibility to blaspheme God, which is an unforgivable sin, to completely deny that what he did in your life for many, many, many years was fake, and that, and that was not of God, and, I, and I'm going to choose evolution. You have the ability to do that. Okay, and I think Revelations, I think Hebrews 6 is a perfect example of someone who for many, many years follow God and they fell away. You, you do have the possibility, okay? And if you're a new believer, this is a message for you. I, it's so hard for new believers to understand this. If you are a new believer, you must understand that, first of all, God loves you and Yes, you're going to sin. You're going to fall into sin. You do have an advocate, which is Jesus, to forgive you. But if you look at the Old Testament system of sacrifice, they did not go and kill a cow once a year or, or once for their whole life and then rely on that one sacrifice to forgive them for eternity. That was not the way the system was set up. Everything from the beginning to the end, the reason why Jesus even came was to help man realize their heart condition, the, their condition of pride, their condition of doing something for God without having something in here change. Like they, they like for example, maybe they're uh, they're feeding all of their you know people that are working for them, and they're everybody's nice and rich and wealthy and healthy, and they've got coats and houses and taken care of. And you have some little poor person who comes in and he's got sores all over his body and he has no clothes and and you say to that person you know you know you can't even have my scraps like get out of here <laughs> well guys when you hear jesus talk about the rich man and lazarus he was not very nice to people the heart condition had no care for others. Their heart condition had no love for others. And if you look at Paul and all of the writers in the in, in Peter and all the writers of Scripture, you're going to notice something in very very important. You start with faith. You add to your faith. At the end of your faith, the mature Christian will have love, and will take care of the poor and the widows and the elders and the orphans and and all that stuff. Like that's mature. That's the that is the maturest person ever. And, and, and you'll see people all throughout your life who will teach that maturity is knowledge, that, you, that maturity is, is the blessings of God, that you're going to receive some type of blessing. If you give more, you'll receive more. And they'll, they'll think that, the, that, that maturity is somehow in a, a visual representation of your wealth. Or maybe they'll see that your maturity is in, you know, how big your chest is puffed out in your church, you know, like how much better you are than everybody else and, and how many people you've went and visited and how many people you've went and prayed for and how, and how much money you've given and all these things, okay? No, none of, like, maturity is in how well you love God and love your brother at the end of this life, Okay, my biggest challenge is taking Jesus's word where he says, whoa, you hypocrites. And he just goes over and over and over with all of his woes. And it's, it's, it's jumping into the seat of Jesus as the judge, as the one who is condemning and writing that condemnation with Jesus. And, and I do think a little bit of that is it's extremely important in the church. Like we should judge people inside the church but I'm specifically talking to outsiders. Like when someone comes into church, they they really don't believe in Jesus. You can tell they don't really know Jesus. Maybe they say they love God or something like that, but they don't really know Jesus, and you know that. First of all, a lot of people don't realize that or, or can can discern that in people. They think everybody's saved because they're they're an American or whatever. But it's important to leave the condemnation at home when you see those people. Because maturity in and of itself will see that person and they'll love them. 
Okay, and that's what God does with us. He chose us while we were yet sinners. He's choosing them while they are yet sinners. Your condemnation is not helping. So just know that before time began, if you want to look at predestination or election or all these things, like look in the Bible. If if it's written in the Bible, those things are predetermined. They're predetermined. Those people did have an election. You can see the future. You can see the past. You, if your name's not written in there, there's no predetermined plan, election, or anything for you. You know, you know, God in time future and time past may and could write a book, right? And and could write your name in there in the future. He could, because he's he's in the time present and time past, and and he's he is the A and the Z and the Alpha, the Omega. He's the one in and outside of time, so he could, and. And he does. And and another thing you have to you have to you have to also realize this. Like some people want to put God in such a box and say, you know, well God has predetermined me to be this type of person or whatever. And and they like to write their own books about God and say, This is what God you know, God, you know, he he once once saved me at the altar. Now I'll never and he, that's the same for you. And they like to predetermine all these things for their congregation. And they like to put God in these little these little boxes of time. Because that's what they live in, and that's what they understand things through. If you understand that God is not looking through a box of time, which is almost impossible to understand, because that's always that's what all literature is, that's what all time is. It's it's us seeing the past and the future. We need to understand that God is a God who is, he's painting a picture. He's working out. He's working on a, on a perfectly beautiful plan. Okay, and and he is time. That that plan is that is timeless. Okay, <laughs> he can change it if he wants. If he wants, he's not a god who changes, but he can change things. Like if if you think that God, if you think that you can close a door and ignore all the babies crying in the other room, but you don't think that God can close a door and ignore you because of your sin. You've put God in a box, and he's less than you. He's actually less than you. you you're putting the all-knowing, all-powerful God, and you're making him so small that he couldn't even close a door. Unbelievably small. If you're putting God in a box, and you're saying that God, um, that God only must keep some promise, because one person put their faith in him a long time ago, then you sure, sure, sure better know that that's a promise in Scripture. And a lot of preachers, I'm going to tell you right now, when they look at a promise, they leave out all of the things describing the people of that promise. And if you if, if you know anything about conditions, uh, everybody wants to say, well, God loves me unconditionally. He loves me unconditionally. And they love that word about God, the unconditional love of God. And it just, you know, they songs about it. If you leave out all conditions, all conditions, and you leave out faith, you leave out belief, those are conditions, then you've left out the Bible. And the God that you believe in, you put him in a box because you have an idea of love that isn't true. <laughs> I'm just being honest with you. If you really want to know who God is, read his word. If you really want to know who God is, read his word. Apply his word and understand his word. Because the sheep, they, they hear him. God knows them. And they follow him, the shepherd, which is Jesus. Nothing can snatch them out of his hand. If you want to know what security looks like, if you want to know what the pre what predestination looks like, find yourself in the hand of God. Follow him. Make sure he knows you. Okay? And hear him. Like, hear him. Make sure he knows you and follow him. Like, you will find in that, and it's written in scripture, that Nothing can snatch you out of his hand. Like, that's security, okay? That's predestinating yourself to 
if you'll be in that condition, that condition, that there are promises in Scripture. But if you say, oh, there's no conditions, and you fall right back into your sin, you don't know God, you don't hear Him, you don't follow Him, you love your money, you love your things, you love, you, 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 you boast in the way you speak, the way you understand things, the knowledge that you have. I'm sorry, you are stupid. I'm stupid. We are all unwilling at many times to realize how much greater he is than us. And that's why when we read something about all of these verses about predestination or election, that's why we get pride in ourselves and we start saying, well, I, I'm definitely one of those elect people, you know, definitely. Because, you know, I said yes to Jesus, but I mean, he really chose me. I mean, before time began, he chose me. And, you know, there's nothing that I can do at this point, nothing he can do, nothing anybody can do to, to, to change that. And the <laughs> it's like, a, you know, you're like a, some, God is some type of computer. You know, he programs, you know, your name into the, to the code and like he can't, he, you know, the, the one who creates that code cannot even change the code. Like you're less than a computer. You're less than the programmer of that computer if you put God in that box. It's absurd. But... In many ways, I love those people too. I love the fact that people sometimes, you know, they, they juggle with these these concepts because if you don't juggle with them, if you don't juggle with the concept that God is timeless, if you don't juggle with the concept that, yeah, there was some people elected and predestined, you're going to come to an idea of Bible that you know it all. Like some people in some congregations, they become so legalistic that, it becomes about you and your works. And well, if I'm good enough, if I'm good enough, then God will say yes to me. If I'm, if I'm not very good, then God will say no. And so then you start evaluating what's too good, you know, or what's too bad, and what's good enough. <laughs> if that's what you're thinking in your mind, you've missed it. You've missed it. It's not about being too good or being too bad. It's about accepting Jesus. It's about believing in him and worshiping him at his feet and trusting him every day when you wake up. Not looking back at the time you said yes, but yes, you did say yes. You did receive it. You were born again. And today I will follow Jesus. Tomorrow I'll wake up and follow Jesus. The next day I'll wake up and follow Jesus. What Jesus, what can I do today? Jesus, what can you do today? Jesus, I pray for these people because I know that you're hearing those prayers. And one day, like this, these prayers that maybe not have been answered are stored up in a bottle as it says in, in Revelations. And, and though we lift it up to heaven, the incense of those prayers. Because I believe your word and I know that you're able and I will trust you. You guys, I hope this helped a little bit. Um, I don't know everything. Like, open God's Word and read it for yourself. Understand it. Struggle with it. We all must, as as uh, Israel did, we must all wrestle with God at some point in our life and wrestle with these scriptures. Because if we don't wrestle with these scriptures and we don't, you know, maybe our hip gets beaten down or maybe we'll walk with a limp or... You're going to be proud your whole entire life. You're going to be so proud. And unfortunately, you might miss, you might miss God's plan for your life because he desires that, and this is verse, this is in the scripture. You can't leave this out. He desires that all would be saved. And he's made a way through the gospel that all would receive faith in him. And he's given all all the ability to either say yes or no okay there there may be some type of election stuck in your brain that you can't get over and you you you, you give god all this um well if he elected this to happen for the good he must have elected this to happen for the bad and you you make god out to be this evil being that determines the bad and determines the good and you've stuck him in this box of time instead of realizing that you're stuck in time and that he has given you a responsibility. He has given you a way. He has given a way for you to be saved. And if you if you reject it, the one that is timeless will reject you. It's as simple as that. 
and God who is love <laughs> and he died like literally like he had to come and die because that's what love is like love is the greatest act of love is someone who laid on his life for his friends like he, like he literally had to come and die for you to show you that he loved you and if you're not willing to let God the one who loves you love you then while you're burning in hell while you're apart from God and you're and you're trying to give your brother a drink or or you're trying to give your brother a drink in heaven or, or you're trying to come out of heaven come out of hell to go tell your brothers that this is this is a real place like there's going to be a great gulf fix between heaven and hell and you're not going to be able to do it then today is the day you can say yes to Jesus today is the day you can warn your family your friends your brothers your sisters today is the day of salvation the bible says and the the way that you can have salvation in Jesus is to trust him the way that you can become part of this plan of God the way that you can be part of this predetermined predestined love of God is to say yes to Jesus if you haven't said yes to Jesus, it's very simple. Fall on your face as the wise men did, the magi did when they came and saw the little baby Jesus and they worshiped. Worship the God who loves you enough to die for you and thank him for saving you and trust him every day from that point forward. He said he will send you his Holy Spirit that will help you the Holy Spirit will guide you. The Holy Spirit will direct you. But if you reject it, it's just like Adam and Eve in the garden. Like, if you reject God because of your sin, you know, God, He can close doors. Like, in the garden, like, He's Adam, Eve, where are you? And they clothed themselves, they were ashamed. You can become ashamed of what you're doing. You can become condemned by your sin. I love you guys. Um, just realize who God is and what he wants to do for you. Like bow your head, surrender your life. Today, be born again. Remember the day you were born again. And then, follow him every day from that point forward. Love you guys.